Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's masterclass. We are so excited to have you all here today. My name is Sujin Kang, and I'm the Senior Events Manager here with the CMX and Bevy team. I'm just looking at the chat, and we have people from all over the world. We have people from Nigeria, from Tokyo, from Kansas, Tennessee, San Francisco. What an exciting group we have here from DC. Well, anyway, we are so excited to have you for today's uh, masterclass on understanding and overcoming the six burdens of community growth. So we have the next hour together where we'll hear from our speaker, Samantha Venia Logan, and she goes by Venia, and we'll then close our time with a Q&A. And of course, this session will be recorded and posted onto our CMX YouTube channel for all of us to view afterwards. So also, I also want to take a moment to announce and share that early bird registration for CMX Summit is now open. It's taking place on October 4th and 5th in Redwood City. So please be on the lookout for the links I'll be posting in the chat. We'll be announcing our first phase of speakers very soon, which we are so excited about. And also, I highly recommend subscribing to our newsletter for the latest updates. And lastly, this masterclass is provided, is sponsored by Bevy, Discourse, Common Room, Hive Bright, and Work Out Loud. So thank you to all of our sponsors for making this event possible. So with that said, I'm going to stop share here. I'm going to introduce today's guest speakers, Samantha Venia Logan. Hello, Venia. Hello. And Venia Hello. is a Yes, uh, she is a community architect and founder of Socially Constructed Online, which is a consultancy and e-course business that helps companies build strong community strategies, place community managers, and level up those community manager skills by using an iterative community network. So Venya, thanks so much for joining us today, and I'm so happy to pass it to you. Absolutely, wonderful. I am very, very excited to be here. Um, I see a lot of people that I know and also a lot of people that I don't know. So um, super happy to have everyone here. Um, so before we do get started, a little bit about the chat. Uh, this is going to be a particularly active and I hope vulnerable um, set, but we also have a lot of stuff to go through. We have six burdens of community. Uh, I'll explain what those are here in a little bit. But crucially, this uh, is going to be a little bit more than a presentation because these six burdens are all in my head, right? Like they came from me based, granted, on a lot of experience. I've been building communities for about 10 years across academia, digital marketing. Um, I have a lot of experience in that area, but they're all inside my head, right? So if I'm going to um, present these six burdens to you and live up to my reputation within the social science of community, it would behoove me to make this six burdens of community growth concept, currently a hypothesis, into an actual full-fledged socially scientific study and process. Uh, so that's largely what we're going to be doing today. I'm super, super hyped to actually launch this. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, sound off for the chat for me if you are ready and agree with this promise that you'll be extra active and extra vulnerable and willing to provide your expertise and your experiences in your own communities uh, here in the class. Wonderful. Yes, all in. Let's go. Yup, yup, yup. Um, I can see so much hype. So let's go ahead and get started here. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, sharing now. And we're going to pop into that slideshow. OK. And let me actually move all y'alls over to the second screen over here. That way I can see that beautiful, wonderful, fast scrolling chat. Uh, and everyone should now be able to see the screen. Perfect. All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started, y'all. Uh, first and foremost, let's introduce you because I have a hypothesis. Um, and that hypothesis is about the six burdens of community growth. 
Before we get started, though, I just want to talk. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, uh, but I've been developing community for about 10 years, and I started in queer spaces, uh, specifically around people who weren't out yet online, so you couldn't measure them traditionally. And because of that, I went to school and I'm like, how do I do this measurement of community thing? How do I build this? Uh, and school's like, we don't know. Uh, anthropology, business, communication, journalism. We don't know. So I took them all. And now I have a degree in communication and anthropology of virtual worlds combined with, I did not necessarily realize when I left that school that I didn't know how the internet worked. So I went and became a full stack marketer to better understand the machinations of the sites that we are building those communities on. Ever since then, I've been uh, participating in a lot of communities, and this is what I do for a living. I'm very happy and graceful about it um, to build cultural spaces for clients, and then I use them to teach the social science of community to people like you in the socially constructed discord. So uh, that's what I do. I have three promises for you in general. First and foremost, plan big and progress small. We are gonna go over a lot of potential problems as you start to grow your community. Uh, and it's important to have solutions for these particular problems, infrastructure, processes, and facilitation strategies. But overall, I want you to do me a favor and just set a single precedent for your community and then build momentum for that. Do one thing get good at it, and then get better. And once you're done, this recording is always going to be available. I'm always going to be available in my own Discord channel. Uh, you can come back later to learn the next thing. Um, so with that having been said, here's what we're doing. Um, we are going to first start off, as is always the case with every presentation, the people who know me well have probably already heard this, but we're gonna go over the social scientific process. Um, I think it's critical because a lot of people have not actually been exposed to the way that this process works. And once we understand it, we're going to use that structure in order to talk about the six burdens of community growth. And keep in mind, again, this is in my head. It's based upon my observation. So we're going to prove it. We are, over the course of the next year, this is the announcement right here today, we're going to do the social scientific process in order to build more information and study and help these six burdens grow and morph into a full-on proper theory. And we're going to do it in public. So I'm super, super excited about that. Let me know in the chat. I see what you're doing right now, Joyce. Uh, good research process. I love it. Let me know if you are up for doing this. Let me know if uh, we can actually do the social science with you. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So with that said, let's get started with the scientific process. Uh, the social scientific process, let me take you back to sixth grade, right? Um, you looked at the scientific method, which was this concept of we have a hypothesis and we are going to figure out what variables, what levers do we need to pull in order to better understand this thing. So we'll set up those variables and then we'll just set up an individual experiment for one variable. We'll run that and we'll learn. And then once we've learned, we'll start a second experiment in order to learn the second variable. And over time with repetitive continual experiments published to the public, we have this scientific method that allows us to systematically understand our world. Problem though, uh, this doesn't really work when the variables can all be the same. If you as a community manager have ever watched a paid ads marketer be like, hey, we're rolling out this ad to Facebook and we're gonna test it and we have about a thousand people and the ad goes ridiculously well, a huge ROI factor, like times eight. And they're like, yes, it worked. So then they expanded again to 5,000 people and it works and it goes really, really well, but their ROI, instead of being that eight, goes to a more somber times five. And they're like, do you know what? It still works. We're still at times four. Do it again. But this time we're gonna send it out to 50,000 people because clearly this system works and it fails and it fails really hard. And the reason is not necessarily because of the quote variable. The variables all stayed the same. What changed was what we call the scope or the site 
for research, which we are sampling from a larger public. Because the scope can change, you can have the exact same variables. You can run the exact same experiment, and you will always get different results. How do you solve that problem, especially when it comes to measuring the emotions, the feelings, the sentiments, and the opinions of a general public health? So what we had to do in science was switch from measuring the variables to measuring the scope that changes. We're going to ask for the three variables, and then we're going to change to a scope. For example, you might have a veteran set of community members in your online community, and they brought up this concept, this idea that is um, helpful for your community. And then you're like, okay, let's see if our new users will find this helpful. Great, they did. But then you ask vendor users, and they're like, no, 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 this would be terrible for me by understanding the distinct differences between scope across a similar variable, you have the capacity using social science to map out and understand the impact of your community in one giant long experiment. So we're not doing 20 or 30 different experiments. We're picking a variable and we're moving the scope over and over again in order to better, better study it. Now, there's one chief rule here that I want to discuss. This is what social science looks like. It's messy, right? So you have this initial stage where you go into a community and you start making observations. You start putting together everything that people say. And it gives you several tentative mini theories and hypotheses. So you go back to that old data and then you say, hey, are these hypotheses present? And we just didn't see them. And then after that, you interrogate it, and then you go back to those people and you say, hey, more specifically, there seems to be this thing in the data. Can we talk about it? Uh, can we talk about it with you? And then after that, we go to the next scope and we're like, okay, small group, focus group, uh, what do you think? And then over time, we start to get this better idea. In order for that to operate, we have to have rules. And as far as academics goes, as far as white papers go, there are five main ways of properly validating your data. Now, typically, and for those who know me, um, I tend to skip over these because truth be told, because you're not publishing a white paper, all you need to know is A concept applies to B population only so far as C limitation. As long as all your observations as a community manager appeal to this formula, you will have a pretty solid process for understanding, structuring, and analyzing all of your qualitative data in a way that your data analysts in the marketing department and in the software department feel pretty happy with. That having been said, like I said, this is the kickoff of a social scientific experiment, which means this is that one occasion for all of those who know me, this is new content. We're actually going to dive deeper into how this works. So first off, there's an analytical process, and this is the phase that we're in right now. We're looking at a hypothesis and we're applying it to a well-defined population. In other words, that would be you, right? We are going to look at your communities here in this group in order to better understand how the six burdens impact your communities. And then after that, we're going to go do this again. Uh, I'm going to have additional presentations in open source and other areas in order to change my sites. And then I'm going to publish for each individual site a set of case studies. Once that's done, I'll have the ability to take all that qualitative data across those scopes and using contextual analysis, I can understand the differences and similarities between two individual sites. In other words, we're comparing the scope. And once I've done so, we have the ability to abstract that data into more of a statistical quantitative basis. But once I've done that, we're not done yet. We extract it to a larger population, but we're going to find weird pieces of things in the data. And all of those need to be reconsidered. And that's where we start to go back to that case-to-case -case method, and we start to pull back the veil on this process. So this is the process that I am now going to use for the six burdens of community. And right now we're in that analytical phase. So what I want to do now for this particular masterclass 
is not just discuss the six burdens and define them and build them out for you, but I also want to talk about the prior research, the theories that I'm using as lenses to understand each of these structures. This is me presenting a field of research that not only helps you in your communities to build structures, frameworks, strategies, and processes in order to handle these six burdens, I, I think that's going to be very useful to you, right? But I also am going to use it to contextualize each of these issues when we go into actual formal interviews. Um, so what I would like to do is basically discuss this, get your questions in the chat. Like I said, this is going to be very, very active. Um, and I'd like to discuss those problems. And then we're going to use the discussion that we have today as the basis for me to put together an interview semi-structured script. And then we're going to actually interview all of you. Does that seem good? Are you on board with that? Yep, fun. <laughs> I love it when people get so excited about social science. Um, this is going to be like such a big thing for me. I'm so excited, Manuel, with like the hands raised. Oh my God. Yes, wonderful. All right, so let's get started. We are going to go through each burden individually, but as a quick level, the six burdens that I've largely identified uh, in my own experiences building community are issues of allocation, wherein responsibility goes from, hey, I'll take this task on on a regular or weekly basis and I'll attend meetings and give you progress into something more about allocation because your community has grown past a certain threshold. A large majority of people are not willing to take on continual tasks. And as a result, it becomes micro tasks and it becomes more project focused. The next one is attribution, which is the idea that curated content across a group of people as it grows in scale becomes vague because attending meetings on the regular becomes very difficult. Uh, the slack becomes harder and harder for people to grasp as more information comes in. And as a result, you need infrastructure to make that easier. The third one is contribution. And contribution is a little bit interesting. Um, this is the notion that as people get more involved in the community and as it grows, the responsibility of work limits based upon the individuals that you communicate with. And as a result, a smaller number of people are responsible for a larger number of tasks. While the reward of those tasks is exponential, the entire community experiences it, the members who are doing that work, the work available is logarithmic. It kind of starts to slow down a lot. The fourth one is distribution. Distribution is the idea that your preferred communication channels, your structured communication, like join the Slack community or join the discourse community forum, um, you are developing infrastructure for people to talk. But as your community starts to grow, unstructured communication becomes the prevalent way that people interact with your community. And as a result, you start to go, hey, there's a larger percentage of observers or lurkers in this community, and I don't know why. And the reason is because they've left that structured communication area, and they've gone on to other platforms that you're not quite measuring, uh, which can often be a problem, right? The uh, fifth one is remuneration. This one has to do with funding your online community and communicating with your primary stakeholders, determining your community ROI, and showing your community's value. As your community starts to grow, your investors start to move away because of abstraction from your community. You start to have to really show them the value, and it becomes harder and harder and harder for those individuals to see the long-term outlook of where this community is growing because your community starts to look homogenous from a distance. And then sixth is stratification. And this is the big one because it's the one everyone talks about, right? This is where DEIB, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging come from, right? This notion that as your community starts to stratify, you start to build exclusivities within your community, VIP groups, veteran groups, and all of that is in order to keep people engaged and talking and pe keep people in small groups. 
But one of the big issues with that is that your community also starts to stratify and the share of voice across each individual member becomes harder for you to manage. So that was a lot. I'm overwhelming you, right? Uh, so what I recommend, I do have the slides if Sujin would be happy to uh, toss a link to the actual slides into the chat. Um, but we're actually going to go through each one of these individually. How do people feel about this for the time being? Sounds good. Wonderful. Stoked. Awesome. You're in. Great. <laughs> All of you are now my research guinea pigs. Get excited. <laughs> okay. So allocation, let's first talk about this, where tasks move from a notion of responsibility to a notion of allocation. Um, one of the primary problems and the theories about this has to do with the social psychology and the socio-cultural drivers of the diffusion of responsibility. Now, a lot of people may know this uh, by a more common different name as the bystander apathy effect. Uh, so John Darley uh, had come up with this observation that uh, generated a huge social psychological theory and experiment uh, where an entire group of people refused to help a woman who was being attacked in a public space. And he noticed that because a large majority of the people uh, in the area were looking at the event but not acting, there must have been something underlying that interaction where any one individual would be happy to help. But the more people you have, the more presumption that someone else will step in, the more apathy they build for the situation. Uh, and because of this, someone else being able to help, no one stepped up to help the woman. Uh, this is called the bystander effect. Uh, and especially with community, things that happen in small groups also happen in larger scopes. They also happen socially, and they especially happen in virtual environments, which are a step removed, right? Now, CMX is really, really good with this. Yuri, uh, Yuri Lazaruk is incredible with this because he's like, communities are places where people go to help others. And the infrastructure and the approaches that Yuri has taken in order to solve this problem um, are worth looking at, right? So sociocultural drivers that do impact this include crowd responsibility. It's less necessary for me to help because someone else, I'm sure, will step in. If you've seen a car on the side of the highway, right, um, you start to think, OK, I'm going 70 miles an hour and I'm about to pass them. It's a very low likelihood that I'll be able to help them in any way. Someone else will come along and they'll stop to help the driver. And what ends up happening is the driver ends up on the side of the road for half an hour, right? Um, there's also this notion of adverse peer pressure. Others are more qualified. Others can help them better. Others will step in. Others will know what to do. And because of that, they start to get this notion of, I won't take on this task because I'm less qualified than others. You may not even know who those others are, but this is the assumption that allows you to get away from the stress of getting involved. And that's what emotional separation really is. It's this mechanic that you can use to reduce distress without taking a task on. Now, this happens at scale in our communities, right? And as communities grow, you have to build infrastructure to solve this problem. So um, one thing that you need to consider is something called approach avoidance, which is a paralysis that people have based upon the tension between stress, I need to step in, I need to help this person, I need to make this my problem, and reward. If I do this, I'm going to be able to help that individual. I will get an intrinsic sense of self-worth. At scale, intrinsic reward kind of reduces in value in comparison to a, well, if I step in, what am I going to get, right? Other people will value this. So let's talk about solutions. Before I move into any recommendations or anything like that, I'd like to know if this is striking a chord with any of you. Uh, did you have a situation 
where something like this has happened to you before in your community or elsewhere. And keep in mind, if you make this contribution, your comment is a part of this social scientific study, right? So I'd love some detail and some explanation. You don't need to necessarily talk about your own community, um, but communities that you've experienced in the past. I'd love to be able to use your comments as that experience. Um, so let's take a few minutes to do that. And in the meantime, coffee, it is the nectar of all life, right? Uh, Siddhartha, yes. Uh, Maya, absolutely, definitely. Thanks for sharing this, uh, both personally and in community. I would absolutely love it if you could elaborate on that. And uh, I'll kind of pull it into the research itself. And um, again, these same comments are exactly how I'm going to build a semi-structural interview um, come time for us to move forward. The community I run is uh, super hesitant to answer any questions, I presume from other or new users. Um, and they also struggle to add or share their own experiences. Yeah, that's a, that's a big, big, big deal. I'd also love to hear how you've uh, accomplished or overcome this particular burden. Oh, Anand, um, I'm still in the process of building a new community. Um, you're a web two and web three developer and you run into a YouTube channel. Oh, okay. Looks like web three for mass adoption. That sounds really interesting. Uh, Carly, I manage a SaaS product community weighing the value of me versus internal users, uh, responding to external users, questions versus external users and feeling empowered, like the sense of empowerment. Yeah. Um, do I have enough experience? Do I have enough authority to really choose to step in? Um, Lynn, I've been hesitant to answer questions. Oh, you've personally been, that's fascinating. Um, you absolutely know the answer in a professional forum, but what if you're wrong? What if you look dumb? Yeah, that's wonderful. It also has like this status development. Oh, Meg, Carly, I feel that. I love that support in the chat. Um, would you say this is related to imposter syndrome? Great question. Um, I think that when we add status, for sure, um, you should toss that into the Q&A for later uh, so that we can revisit it. I view the Q&A often as a parking lot. Heather, uh, first off, how are you doing? Hi, Heather. I've always believed that a Heather-driven community isn't a good thing in my in my two communities I founded, unofficial and, un and official members help step into strategic engagement. Absolutely, cool. So let's go ahead and move on now. Uh, one particular area where I think it's done really, really, really well is in uh, church congregations. We often look at church congregations in anthropology because it's one of the oldest institutions which have developed a very clear structurally developed culture, others being military and in academia. But this is my friend, Dana Leitze. Uh, way back in 2012, I actually worked with the Unitarian Universalist Church often, and there were some observations that I made. Um, I started just as an artist in their general area, and I accepted a single project. Uh, on a Saturday in April for Earth Day, uh, we collected a bunch of trash. We went dumpster diving with all of the kids in the youth group. And then we asked those kids to create amazing artwork with them. Uh, some people use styrofoam, others used uh, Coke cans. Uh, one particular student actually built a rocket that was capable of putting a rocket engine into a pop bottle without it breaking, which I thought was pretty fantastic. Uh, and one of the things that happened was first, they asked me to create this project and they recognized a passion. Dana approached me at the coffee hour and I had a white cup. They have this program called the red cup program where people who have experience and status, they're well known in the communities, they carry around a red cup. And then people who are new, they grab white cups and then everyone else gets blue cups. Um, and the red cups will actively seek out the white cups in order to connect new users uh, with the expectation that they'll connect 
with their friends and family members in the glue cup. And it does a really, really good job at creating a lot of social glue. But one of the important things about this is that Dana now knows who she can reach out to in order to allocate specific tasks. Remember, it's not about responsibility, but she comes up and she says, hey, would you be willing to do the babysitting for next week's sermon? You only need to do it the once. I'm allocating a singular task to you. And if it goes well, then she'll ask again. But she never conscripts volunteers from the pulpit. She never says, hey, general uh, congregation, general world, this is what I would like to do which I think is a really, really great solution for this problem. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to the next one, if everyone's ready. Oh, I absolutely love all of this content in the chat. Um, I'm looking forward to going through all of this later. Um, the next one that we're gonna talk about is attribution. Uh, so as a quick reminder, because we have a lot of people going through this, um, Attribution is about the low context content, the gatherings, the experiences, the meetings, things like this, right? Um, they grow vague with scale and it becomes very, very difficult for newcomers to really understand what they need to do. And one of the big aspects of this problem, uh, we hear this all of the time, right? You need to do things that don't scale if you have any expectation of scaling your community. But once you hit that inflection point, you're doing things that don't scale like regular meetings and webinars, one-on-one -on -one conversations, small group sets, support groups. And you as a community manager, like you can manage it, you can handle it. But as you start to scale, you hit this inflection point where you can't do those things that scale anymore. You have to step away from your community. You move from a gatherings and meeting kind of situation, you'll remember Priya Parker, the art of gathering, um, into this role of saying, okay, we need more people to step up. We need more people to volunteer. If we want to keep our small groups going, we need structure and solution to really make this work. And one of the big issues with this is that gatherings, and I'm just going to kind of move away from the solutions thing real quick, the notion of gatherings and meetings and content, when you're watching a recording like this webinar, it's not necessarily the best medium for you to really pick in order to solve this problem, right? Um, so one thing that I want to cover, and I do apologize, my slides are slightly out of balance, is that I'm viewing this within the context of rich media context theory which is this notion that your meetings, your Slack channel, your messages create an incredible amount of belonging, huge feedback. People really feel like their voice is being heard. But as you start to scale that, you need to include high context media, blogs, YouTube uh, videos. And even for this meeting, what would be better for us to engage with this recording is not just me putting this presentation um, on CMX's YouTube channel, which it will be, by the way, but I should splice this and intermix it with more activity, more description. I should take out all of the repetition throughout this conversation to make it more palatable as a long-term media feature. And what I'm doing in that process is I am adding context and I'm taking out what's confusing to create a longer-term asset. So a lot of uh, communities who start in a Discord or a Slack or a low context media, like an IRC channel, they find a necessity to build infrastructure like a long-term forum where the conversations can be kept and housed or a YouTube channel where they can report on those interactions. So a few uh, solutions that I would like to hear as we go through. Uh, oh, y'all are already doing it. That's wonderful. Um, just toss some experiences. How have you solved this problem? Are you struggling with this problem? Uh, have you run into it before? Um, so let's start with Ali. I manage an Airbnb style community of about a thousand people, a thousand hosts specifically, um, but for outdoor furniture showrooms. That's interesting. Um, I attribute a lack of engagement to members just simply being too busy, uh, and I often hear from them, but then they diffuse that responsibility and approach avoidance to reframe your thinking. 
Um, that's interesting. I love that. I'd love to hear more about that. Um, you give them specific tasks and time frame that make it more likely to be successful. Perfect. I manage a community of, uh, hold on. I manage a community of projects, manage a community of project managers, and I feel like I am the only driver to engagement and communication. Yeah, that happens quite frequently for sure. Um, we got pushback scaling with one group of expert users from an intimate Slack group into a larger forum experience. Uh, and we needed to do that to become more inclusive and the benefit the business. Yeah, sometimes there's this notion of uh, if I make a change in this community or if we scale it, if we bring people in um, en masse or we start to publish all of that content, we're giving away the secrets. We're giving away the secret sauce. We're changing the dynamic of the people involved because they're worried that anything they say will be published. Definitely. I'd love to hear uh, any solutions that you might have, any advice for Jennifer in the chat. All right. So let's go ahead and move forward. Uh, I do want to bring up a quote from the same book, The Art of Gathering, uh, wherein gatherings make context. They sum up our lives. And if you remember, uh, gatherings are also low context. Oftentimes when people are present, when they're there, that sense of context is already present. But it's also assumptive, right? It's not something that you can put into text in a blog after the fact. And it's not often, although there are some exceptions, it's not often something that you can put into a recording. So I think it's important to recognize that in gatherings and events, there is a context that you also have to transfer into your longer context stuff. But also remember to keep the people who are present in mind. So rich media context theory, it's just as much an observation for the problem as it is potentially a solution. So maybe look into what systems and architecture you can use. If you're a high context platform like a stadium community, you go on Twitch all the time, maybe consider um, a low context option uh, for people to interact with. Dan Dan the Fireman, a really awesome YouTuber. He was super successful at this when he launched a Discord community off of the back of his YouTube streams. All right. Um, now, another potential solution, and this one's really fun. Uh, I also want to say I'm claiming this, right? This came out of my own research uh, that I was working with at Guild Wars 2. So I went into a massively multiplayer online game, and I discovered this role-playing guild that abused and broke the game infrastructure in order to tell their own story. So the developers had no idea. They had been building their own thing. And what we discovered in that community was when you're role playing, there is a strong reliance on a sense of shared imagination, shared identity, and it requires a certain amount of structure. But again, it's a game, right? They're role playing. They're taking on characters. They want it to be fun. So there was this notion, a dialectical tension between having the structure necessary for everyone to understand what's going on in the moment and the informal or abstract connections and interoperability. So what happens is when your community is too informal, it's too low context, people crave task-based discussion, but they just don't know what that is. And our job as community architects and facilitators is to fill in that role. They also do want a certain modicum of hierarchical control. Can someone please take the spearhead on this particular project? Because like it hasn't really gone anywhere, right? And then that produces a shared sense of perception. They crave this clarification in their communities. And likewise, when it's too firm, oftentimes they crave more relational discussion. They're like, oh, this is so boring. You're shilling all your stuff all the time. Everything is content. Is it too much to just ask for a coffee hour? There's also this notion of unfettering power distance. When, and we'll talk about power distance here in a little bit, but when your structure is too robust and solid, they feel like they can't talk to the community manager, to the CEO, to the product management team. You have to lower the power distance by reducing that hierarchical control, right? Because it's gone too far. Then there's also a request for more information and more action. 
we're we're already established. We all get it. We're all on the same page. We have shared perception. Now what? What do we do now? Things have grown stale. So that's a really, really great way of solving the attribution problem. I also briefly want to mention this. Uh, this is not something I'm going to go into hugely, but here's a process that I recommend uh, that you follow. Make it possible for people to have grapevine communication, ideas that are formed, and then ask them through organic conversation to create formal gatherings. That formal gathering will create a simple piece of content that you can then go to the wider community with. And then as you do, you start to ladder up from informal communication to formal communication. Fun fact, this is the very theory I named my company out of. Uh, you'll notice communication constitute organizations theory, very similar to socially constructed dot online. All right. So with that said, let's talk about contribution. Uh, this one's really, really fun. This is actually the first one I identified. Uh, and this one uh, most appeals to like open source communities, uh, communities that at scale uh, struggle with having very finite community membranes that people can really cross and more just organic involvement, right? So what this means is work is logarithmic, but reward is exponential. Let's talk about the unintuitive work reward problem. Over on the right, you'll see that there's a graph of the amount of time individual uh, contributors to different GitHub projects in open source communities uh, spend on those projects. Now, what's important about this is oftentimes they already have their own companies and they are sponsoring the development of the open source projects through the company hours. So a company gets to say, I'd like you to spend five hours per week on this open source project developing it so that eventually we can use it to solve a problem. So some people, about one third of the people will spend less than an hour per week. They'll attend the meeting and at that meeting they'll do work. Um, others will do their homework, right? One to five hours. Others take it upon themselves to build something bigger, something stronger. Uh, my participation with chaos tends to hang out in this six to 10 hour range. Oftentimes it slides down to once per week because I'm doing other things, right? But what this ends up with is that a small amount of maintainers for those projects, four or five people are doing the lion's share of all of the work. But because that short number of people is doing the work, the reward of what they accomplish grows out to the community exponentially, right? But the amount of exponential attention, the amount of people submitting issues and saying, hey, this is a problem, but they don't fix it. They don't take it upon themselves results in that small amount of people having a very specific amount of work. It's logarithmic. They start to slow down. They start to burn out. But the requests exponentially rise as the community increases. So um, what I'd like to do now, we go back into this conversation section. And as a quick reminder, while you're telling your stories, I would love to hear, especially from open source communities right now, um, as you're telling your stories about how you experienced this, what the hurdle is, and especially what infrastructure you've submitted in order to solve it, I would love to hear um, that description so that I can take that chat in and again, add it to the social scientific process in the future. Um, one thing while we're waiting on those answers to come in, because I know you're type, type, typing, um, is especially when it comes to the contribution issue, I also want to talk about mental health, uh, because this is the one that tends to create the most burnout, and it's the one that tends to put the most hats onto the community manager, right? So oftentimes what you want to do is uh, focus on the precedents, focus on the structures that allow you to spread work. Because again, your work is concentrating, your reward is expanding. What you need to do is reverse that process, make them as equal as possible, right? Um, so I would love to hear other people's opinions and thoughts in the chat now. Octopusmovement.org, that sounds fascinating, Catherine. Ah, oh, Stephanie, hey, Stephanie. Uh, 
you had no idea about the octopus movement. That's fantastic. Uh, Mark, yes to hierarchical lowering. My title is director of customer community, but in my community, I sign as the Exabeam community manager. I love that. Um, Catherine, I'm struggling with this right now in the octopus movement. There it is. There's the context I'm looking for. A movement for nonlinear thinkers who think they don't want structure, but they actually get frustrated without it. Yeah. As an ADHD person, that just hits me right in the heart, you know. Um, question from Maria. Uh, and just a quick reminder, put, you, put your Q&A into the chat if you can. Uh, do you believe that Slack is more engaging than Discord? That's probably a different topic. I'd love to discuss that in a little bit. Uh, but they have two different infrastructures that handle the general culture and the theme of the community. Cool. Uh, we are going to run out of time, so I will need to go ahead and move forward. Um, oh, Aaron. I work in video gaming, and a factor that we deal with is the number of those benefiting to the number of those that work as spokespeople. Ooh, an influencership situation. Uh, the ratio is 1 to 100, and it's easier to manage rewards versus 1 to 100,000, even though the work is the same. Yeah, absolutely. Agreed. YouTube ran into a problem like this uh, circa 2013, 2014. That's a part of the uh, research that I've developed as well. So once again, in addition to illustrating the problem, this is also often a solution. Oh, you were at Twitch 2014 to 2021. Oh, I especially want to hear how Twitch managed that for sure. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on. But uh, if you find a interesting situation in the chat, please feel free to respond to that person. So reward and work. So again, work naturally concentrates, reward naturally spreads. So you want to deal with ways of reversing that process to make it as equal as possible. And uh, there are some other solutions that I'm going to recommend at the end of the chat. The next thing I want to talk about is distribution. Um, and I had to put a cat meme in here, right? Like we build like this massive structure and we put together the cat bed and we make sure it's all cute and snuggly. Sometimes we'll put warming pads into the basket and then the cat never uses it. Um, fairly frequently, what you can do is you can actually put a cardboard box into the nest, which I think is absolutely hilarious. Um, but oftentimes, uh, this is the experience that we have as community managers, right? Like we have this structured communication platform and we spend forever in a day architecting it. And then the community is just like, you know what? As you grow, we'd rather just meet over here or we connected in this group, but we actually are just going to talk uh, privately or over social media. Here's the reality. 70% of all organizational communication. We're not even talking about external communities, right? We're not even talking at scale necessarily. 70% of that communication happens via Grapevine. Unstructured communication on non-official platforms. That's huge. That's massive. And if we're struggling to solve that problem in an organization where people are expected to listen to their emails, how are we going to do it for a huge swath of people? We don't pay to be present in our communities, right? And as a result, here's what we're struggling with. This is actually a page from the most recent Constellation report. Uh, I actually really, really hope we're going to get one here soon. Um, but this is causing a lot of problems for our jobs, right? A typical community, as it grows, goes from one, maybe two platforms to six of them. And as a result, we're sitting here trying to juggle across seven different apps. We need completely new tools to measure those communities. And here's the worst part. We can't just take that away from our communities, right? Communities naturally immigrate and emigrate off of platforms. So we have to meet them where they are. We have to communicate in the way that they're happy to communicate, right? How do we solve that problem? So now we're in a situation where like, if this hit your heartstrings, if this is a situation where you're like, oh, I have this thing, right? I would absolutely love to hear it in the chat. Let's see how things go. Oh, the alien graphic major day. Oh, but the cat didn't, Danica. 
all. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would love to hear more about that. You're all about the aliens for sure. I would love to know it, uh, how deep you've gone on that YouTube alien iceberg. That would be really fun. Um, Mitchell Gordon, uh, personally, I really think it differs based upon your reasoning for the community as a large organization that focuses on support and connecting others. We know that the top contributors are really doing this to help others and build their personal brand consulting for sure. Oftentimes, a lot of veterans find that uh, leaving the community makes more sense, except when they're called back explicitly to help them deal with their particular problems. And what that means for them is providing advice and for lack of a better word, shielding their own content, right? Uh, and you have to offer a mode or a pattern for veterans to connect with your newcomers. Remember that red cup, white cup program. I definitely recommend looking into building something similar for your own communities. <laughs> An ancient aliens addict. Absolutely. <laughs> As an anthropologist, I love watching that just to be like, oh, I mean, okay. Yeah. Uh, any other examples on the burden of contribution, the burden of distribution? <laughs> My new BFF, see? Yeah, I agree with that for sure. And we will need to move on if we don't want to run out of time. Okay. So one of the potential solutions is technological affordances theory. So this is the notion or the idea that the technology we put into place allow people um, specific permissions. And that's structured communication, right? We're saying, here's how you should use our platform. But there's also the limitations theory in which people are always going to break your platform. If there is a model or a system, they're not going to ask before they put that into play, they're just going to do it. One really, really good example is when Facebook rolled out the emoji system, uh, they went from a simple like button to five different things, right? And it's this notion that because they built their own voting system, um, people started to use that in order to be like, if you agree with a concept, hit the love button. And it had nothing to do with them loving something. It simply had to do with them saying, I pick option two. Um, so Facebook is just like, oh, we should probably build a voting mechanic. Guess what kept going? And guess what mechanic got ignored? Um, another solution for this is something I call the hundredth monkey effect. This is actually a concept that I use to illustrate something in a community called the precedent momentum formula. All community, I don't care what your job is. You can be an architect, a facilitator, a coordinator. I don't care what your job in community is. All your job boils down to is setting a precedent. We think that we should do this thing in our community and then building momentum until the community is doing that thing on its own without your impact. And then you go off and you find the next thing. How does that work? Uh, there was an anthropological study that was done on the uh, west coast of Russia following like Alaska. And there's these specific monkeys um, that basically work in tribes along the Russian forests, right? And uh, a researcher was there uh, studying the southernmost tribe. And uh, there are natural potatoes in the environment that all of the monkeys tend to pull up. Monkeys have uh, primarily a, a root or a vegetable kind of diet. And frequently, the monkeys would just straight up pull it out of the ground and then eat it. Satisfaction, right? But then a monkey that had gotten close to the researcher watched the researcher pull their own potato, walk over to the ocean across the beach, wash off the potato, and then eat it. So the monkey repeated the action and discovered that the very salty ocean salted the potato. It was better because there was less dirt and there was more salt. So the monkey started doing it. And then one of the monkey's friends started doing it. And then the entire tribe started doing it. And then the research group just decided, oh, that's fascinating. That's really interesting. We got this tribe salting their potatoes. And then they went to a northern tribe up at the top of Russia about two months later. The northern tribe was salting their potatoes. <laughs> it had gone tribe to tribe to tribe to tribe 
the entire monkey population was now salting their potatoes purely because monkey see, monkey do, which is absolutely hilarious. So think about how that applies to your communities. Um, the next one is remuneration, right? So remuneration uh, has to do primarily with your stakeholderships. So funding and support for your communities as your community grows requires additional infrastructure. And that additional infrastructure separates or abstracts the people who are paying for the community from the community themselves. They tend to get less involved. They tend to not really see the value of the community because they're not actively commenting, but they rely on you more to report on the ROI or the value of that community. So as your community grows, you have to build the infrastructure to prove the value of your community. David Spinks, if you don't have value, your community is going to crash. And one of the things that we've been seeing has hit the hardest. Uh, one of my friends, I'm so happy to call her a friend, Erin uh, Staples, just recently published a blog about uh, the fall of community infrastructure. We've been seeing a lot of layoffs, especially in technology. Um, how is that impacting our communities? And this really, really struck me. Time and time again, we hear of layoffs and restructures and shifting goals, and companies are making decisions to keep afloat. If you're not providing value, you're gone. Roles that were once deemed essential and rewarding are now redundant despite the optimism. And for us, our time as a community-driven company has formally ended. So with that, there's this notion now of a delayed discounting rate. This is the psychological notion that is happening in all of your financial contributors where the depreciation of, of value decreases with their closeness to the community, their reward over time. So you have to be very, very careful about how you deliver those results because what you could be saying to them is, hey, you could have $100 right now or in five years, this community is gonna generate $10,000. They might not care about that five years when brass tax happens. Like when your community is now in a downturn, when your company is struggling to make up money, they care more about the $100 now than the 10,000 in five years. So uh, we can talk solutions on this, but I also recognize it's currently 1057 right now. Uh, so very, very sorry, I kind of ran out of time here. Um, one thing that I want to recommend for a solution is, oh, someone pointed it out, layoffs in technology is monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> I love that. Um, that's really, really amusing. Uh, one solution for remuneration is to recognize that the speed of the process for divergent thinking, what can you do, what experimentation can you do, and then the discussion in your communities, the grown zone, and then the conversion zone, really implementing on results, the speed at which you perform this um, process, it's always going to happen in your community. This is always going to exist. But the question is, how fast do you go through it? Your CEOs, when pressure is on, expect this to be faster. Your community, as it grows, will make this happen slower. So you need infrastructure to help it. Lastly, we have stratification. Stratification is all scale and status and silence and natural impact. This is DEIB, right? So um, it starts with this notion called power distance. If you've ever talked to your CEO and you've just gotten like the butterflies in your stomach, you'll start to notice that you don't talk to your CEO the same way you talk to your coworkers or your friends. Um, oftentimes what happens is you start to mitigate communication. And as this happens up the scale, you start to discover that the frustration of the ground soldiers, right? As they get orders from the bosses, they mumble and they grumble, but they say nothing about being wrong. And then the leaders don't understand the actual problem with the boots on the ground. So they start making decisions that make zero sense, right? And as a result, this mitigation, this power distance, has to be increased or reduced. It's not always bad, right? Like you can retake an entire room. If the chat has gone haywire, you can be like, hey, as the community manager, I'm gonna shut this down, right? And that's a high power distance. But when you bring it down, it increases the likelihood of people being able to communicate and share with you actual feedback. Um, again, I, I'm very sorry, I have to skip the solutions. Um, 
we also need to talk about how this exasperates the problem. And you need a solution, you need a structure to solve this, because this is what leads to something called the spiral of silence. This notion that a specific minority of your community will attempt to speak out and not receive the response that encourages them to continue speaking out. So they start to spiral further and further down until they just start to silence themselves. My vote doesn't matter. Speaking up is more likely to target me. Abiola has this absolutely incredible CMX masterclass, um, which talks almost exclusively about solving problems exactly like this. So with that, um, we've now come to the end of the actual process itself. Um, again, here's your problems. And here's what I'm going to do. This is the delivery. This is my promise. I have, across this setup, I've put together some approaches to solving the problem. So what I'd like you to do, go ahead and screenshot this. Uh, Sujin, if you also wouldn't mind posting a link to the slide deck for everyone who does need to go right now, um, I'd definitely appreciate that. So let's uh, pop all of those in there. And uh, these are several structures, several systems that you can kind of play with in order to um, solve the different problems. All right. Really excited to hear about stratification. What we can probably do is we can probably actually host uh, full on conversations about each one of these. Because truth be told, each one is a burden worthy of its own conversation, I think. Um, so uh, I'm going to end this talk before we move into questions. I don't know if Sujin has any time for that or anything like that. And if not, I can take your questions offline. Uh, I need to put my money where my mouth is, right? Um, as set with Kristen Luker uh, in Salsa Dancing into the Social Science, um, this is not a linear experiment. This is uh, understanding scopes and taking in and using the same data and research for different purposes and different reasons. And in that notion, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is, and I'm going to launch the six burdens of community as an actual social scientific process over the course of the next year. So we are going to run through the five valid methods of qualitative data analysis, and we're going to do this across the course of the year in a lot of different events. So first off is research aggregation. Congratulations, that was this. Uh, and then we're going to go into semi-structured interviews to be like, I have a hypothesis. Let's talk about it. So um, Sujin, if you wouldn't mind, uh, I'd like you to go ahead and post the link to a qualification survey. And the purpose of this survey, let me go ahead and bring it up here. The purpose of this survey is essentially for me to determine and qualify who I should interview initially. And even if you don't qualify now, please take and submit the survey because your community might be necessary as soon as I uh, collate and understand the questions. I may need to pop back to you. Um, so I would definitely appreciate it if you did that. And uh, otherwise, that is it. That is all. Um, I would greatly appreciate it if you did that survey for me. Uh, and I look so forward to talking with all of you over the course of an hour about each of these contributions. Awesome. Sujin, I'll hand it to you. Thank you so much, Fania. The chat was just so active today and people are so excited to look through the slides. I posted the links to all of the resources available. So please take a look. We have a qualification survey there. You can join the socially constructed Discord community, subscribe to this YouTube channel, as well as the slides. But please be on the lookout. The recording will be sent out most likely tomorrow, and it will also be posted on our YouTube channel here at CMX. So thank you to everyone joining us. We'll see you at our next masterclass. And thank you so much once again, Benio, for joining us and leading this super insightful time. All right. Absolutely. Have a great one, everyone. Thank you.